Uh, pancreas uh, cancer is uh, gastrointestinal cancer. Most of those tumors are solid tumors, unlike you know the uh, hematologic tumors and, uh, and other tumors. In the U.S., it's the uh, third leading cause of cancer deaths and the seventh leading cause of uh, deaths globally. Uh, in the U.S., you carry almost a 2% chance of developing uh, pancreas cancer. And on diagnosis, only about 10 or 15% of patients are potential candidates to have their tumors cut out. And so right from the get-go, the outcome is uh, fairly dismal. <clears throat> uh, here you see in the middle column, uh, 62,000 cases uh, estimated in the U.S. Uh, this year of pancreas cancer, but it represents actually the number three leading cause of cancer deaths since most of these patients uh, succumb to their disease. Uh, number one is, uh, remains uh, lung cancer, and number two is colorectal cancer. If you look at the trends over the last decade, you see that in the U.S., lung and colon cancer incidence on the top there is drifting down. Pancreas cancer looks like it might be increasing. Uh, mortality from lung cancer has uh, decreased. Uh, mortality from colon cancer is also tending to decrease, and very soon, pancreas is expected to be the second leading cause of uh, uh, cancer deaths in the U.S. Here in Cyprus, you have approximately 5,000 uh, cancer deaths, uh, sorry, uh, cancer case, new cancer cases per year. And you see the uh, most common uh, tumors are the prostate and breast, followed by lung, uh, colorectal, and then thyroid. Pancreas falls at uh, number three here in Cyprus, um, but it does, uh, it, I'm sorry, the seventh leading. Um, uh, cause of cancer here in Cyprus, but it represents the fifth leading cause of cancer deaths, or 6% of the cancer deaths here in Cyprus. The risk factors for pancreas cancer, the, probably the biggest risk factor for uh, pancreas cancer is age. If you live long enough, you're more, much more likely to get uh, pancreas cancer. There is a slight uh, gender uh, difference in that males are at higher risk. There are some differences in, in race uh, there are syndromes of family history that increase your risk, but that represents a relatively small percentage of overall uh, pancreas cancer. Uh, diabetes, pancreatitis, and non-O blood type are also associated with increased risk. Uh, this graph illustrates uh, the um, rate of uh, pancreas cancer with age, and you see it goes up dramatically, peaking at about age 80. And, um, males with a slightly higher uh, incidence uh, compared to women. The um, open circles are um, the uh, Caucasians in the U.S. and you see that uh, uh, African Americans in, in the uh, squares have a higher incidence and then interestingly um, Hispanics and um, Asian and Pacific Islanders have decreased um, incidents. There are a bunch of um, known genetic um, abnormalities associated with uh, pancreas cancer that are listed here. And you can see uh, in the uh, third column the relative risk if you carry one of those somatic mutations. Uh, the next column is the risk by age 70. And what's interesting is that the overall penetrance, if you happen to have the somatic um, uh, uh, defect, shows that th there isn't a very high penetrance for this disease. What's also very different about some of these syndromes, you may know that some of these syndromes are associated with cancer early in life. But if, and so the typical one would be, for example, HNPCC, which is also known as Lynch syndrome. Uh, there, patients get, uh, uh, by definition, Cancer, usually somebody in the cohort uh, uh, gets cancer by age 50. Now, within that HNPCC uh, group, the ones that end up getting pancreas cancer actually don't get it early in life. They also still get it later in life, interestingly. Uh, probably uh, listed here, the only ones that uh, do get pancreas cancer early 
are the familial uh, pancreatitis patients who um, probably get the cancer from their chronic inflammation. There are some modifiable risk factors associated with pancreas cancer. The primary one is smoking. Um, heavy alcohol use is probably a risk factor. Moderate alcohol use, as defined in most papers, about three drinks a day is, is not associated with increased risk of pancreas cancer. Uh, high fat diet and obesity clearly, like in many other cancers, is a strong uh, risk factor. The histology of pancreas cancer is primarily adenocarcinoma, so cancer derived from the, uh, ep uh, the epithelial cells in the mucosa. These are columnar cells that uh, mutate over time. And what's very interesting about pancreas cancer is that there's a very dense uh, stroma uh, ar around the tumor cells. And here you can see <laughs> the uh, cancer cells. But well, the majority of what you see on the slide is actually the stroma. And this is very characteristic of pancreas cancer and is one of the reasons that it's sometimes difficult to prove cancer with needle biopsies because you stick a needle in there, it's hard to sample the uh, tumor. And so uh, that is one of the limitations with needle biopsies. Uh, the less common uh, uh, tumors are uh, listed there. Now, for many years, uh, pathologists had been able to identify what appeared to be precursor lesions, uh, very similar to a colonic polyp that becomes a colon cancer. These uh, lesions were identified in uh, pancreatic uh, specimens. And eventually, uh, in 2004, so relatively recent, the experts uh, got together and sort of defined the nomenclature. And you'll hear the term panins, or pancreatic intraepithelial ne uh, neoplasia. And the panins basically parallel that which you see in the evolution. You'll learn about the, the uh, evolution of uh, normal cells to dysplastic cells to polyps to cancer that was uh, defined by a fellow by the name of Vogelstein in uh, Baltimore. And he's sort of been the world's leader in um, in, in this area, and in actually a lot of the data I'm going to be showing you comes from uh, that lab uh, at Hopkins. By the uh, 2000 era, they published here in the lower half, they started uh, identifying which of the mutations that are associated at each of the steps of the development of this uh, sequence. Everybody was hopeful that by defining the molecular genetics, of uh, these tumors, we can then identify targets to then narrow uh, our therapeutic agents. Since uh, historically, uh, chemotherapy for cancer has been basically a nonspecific poison that would kill anything that divides. Uh, and if you're lucky that the tumor is growing faster than normal cells, you might have a therapeutic ratio and kill more tumor cells than normal cells. Uh, in 2008, the same group um, published um, this pair of uh, studies in science. I call them the bad luck paper. And the reason I call it the bad luck paper is that for many years, patients would sit in front of me and say, why did I get cancer? I don't smoke, I eat healthy, I exercise, I'm not overweight, I have no family history. Most patients have no risk factors for cancer. And so I've, I had always said, bad luck. And so Vogelstein's group did an extensive uh, genomic analysis trying to see if they could identify which mutations are actually uh, most responsible for the development of adenocarcinoma. And unfortunately, they found, in fact, that on average, there were 63 genetic alterations in pancreas tumors. So very, very heterogeneous population of genetic uh, abnormalities. Uh, the uh, companion paper was in glioblastoma, which is a very fatal uh, uh, brain tumor that you'll learn about. Uh, within a couple of years, as they continued to dig with the molecular genetics, they published this uh, uh, schematic of the um, rate or the, uh, the, the evolution of all these mutations. 
and demonstrated that these mutations are actually accum accumulated over many, many, many years. So from the initial uh, multiple mutations that I laid, laid out for the progression of the panins, that's a process that takes a decade. And then you finally get an invasive cancer, and then over the next decade, you start developing the mutations necessary for uh, uh, distant spread or metastases. Unfortunately, clinical disease doesn't become apparent until out here. So from day one, when you, when you have a patient that you can diagnose pancreas cancer, they already have metastatic disease. Unfortunately, we're not very good at finding it. A lot of it is micrometastatic. I mean, a lot of them do have macrometastatic disease you can see on scans. But even the patients who we think have localized disease probably all have already micrometastatic disease. So let's get back to the, 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 the patient. So how do they present? Well, classically, uh, you may hear the term painless jaundice, obstructive jaundice, which is painless. It turns out that most patients actually have pain, but the term painless jaundice is to differentiate it from jaundice or obstructive jaundice associated with gallstones. Gallstones that cause obstructive jaundice give you very acute pain, and so uh, the obstructive jaundice of, of, of tumors is uh, been referred to as painless jaundice. But in reality, almost all these patients have pain. They all present with weight loss. And, uh, and then jaundice for the ones that have tumors in the head of the pancreas. Patients with tumors in the body and tail uh, present even later because those tumors are, uh, remain fairly silent. The diagnosis of pancreas cancer is primarily by CT. Obviously, you can use ultrasound you can, and cholangiography it can be used. Ultrasound, fairly limited uh, for tumor assessment. I mean, you can find the tumors in some patients, but if, you sus if you're not suspecting stone disease, you probably go straight to CT scanning. Uh, CT scanning will give you better anatomy, as you can see here, kind of. <laughs> you can see of this big thing in the middle there, that's actually an enlarged head of the pancreas. But without giving intravenous contrast, you don't really get delineation of anatomy. You give a little bit of intravenous contrast, and now you can start seeing some real anatomy. And here the arrow's pointing to the superior mesenteric artery, which is completely encased by tumor. And you can see the large mass that was not as obvious on the previous scan. You can see that there are areas of hypodensity. So adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, which is the subtype of pancreas cancer that we uh, refer to when we say pancreas cancer is actually hypodense compared to normal pancreas. <clears throat> There's a, a technology endoscopic ultrasound where you can pass an endoscope. It has an ultrasound probe at the end and that's very uh, useful for local staging, giving you a relationship with the tumor to the uh, local blood vessels and also identifying uh, regional lymph nodes. The uh, endoscopic ultrasound is illustrated on top. You can see the probe uh, examining the pancreas through the wall of the uh, stomach, and they have devices that then also allow you to do biopsies, ultrasound-directed biopsies. So that's very helpful in, con in giving you pathologic confirmation of the primary tumor and even lymph nodes. Uh, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, or ERCP, is another endoscopic procedure where you go down the stomach into the duodenum and find the ampulla, cannulate the bile, bile duct, inject retrograde, that's the ER, ERCP. You get pictures of the bile duct and that helps you uh, define some of the anatomy, but it also gives you a way to access the duct that's blocked in patients with tumors in the head and allows you to put stents in to alleviate the biliary obstruction. Uh, uh, less and less commonly, uh, uh, ERCP is either unavailable or unsuccessful, and we still do occasional transhepatic cholangiography where you literally stab the liver to get into a dilated bile duct, and that gives you access and allows you to take pictures of the bile duct. Here showing a blockage starting here in the bile duct 
This is where the pancreas lives. And, it, and once you've established access, you can actually put uh, a metal stent in an area of the uh, obstruction to uh, palliate the obstruction. So when you have patients present with pancreas cancer, only about 10 or 15% on their radiographic imaging, primarily CT, do you have uh, isolated tumors that look like you should be able to cut them out. Uh, the other nine, uh, 85, 90% of patients either have metastatic disease on the very first scan or their tumors are so locally advanced that, that uh, you're prevented from effectively uh, resecting them with uh, uh, what we call an R0 resection where you don't leave any tumor behind. Turns out that in pancreas cancer, if you operate and you leave any positive margins or anything, the outcome is as good as if you didn't operate at all. Not all periampulary malignant obstructions are pancreatic cancer, and it's important to keep in mind the less common uh, tumors of the distal bile duct or cholangial carcinoma, or those of the duodenum and the ampulla. Here's a gross example of a, uh, what we call a Whipple um, specimen or a pancreatic duodenectomy where we've removed the head of the pancreas, and the pathologist has splayed open the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct, and that's the ampulla out there. And if you look carefully here, you can kind of sense that there's a different color. This is normal, more normal pancreas out here. This is a pancreas tumor, but you could see that it would it may be very difficult to differentiate a pancreas tumor from a distal bile duct tumor or an ampullary tumor. They're all right near each other. And now clinically, this, this actually is often an important distinction to make because the overall outcome for these th uh, four types of periampulary uh, adenocarcinomas is very different. I don't know what this... Now, <clears throat> surgeons have been trying to cut these tumors out for over a century. Back in 1898, probably... Uh, the first uh, pancreatic duodenectomy is attributed to uh, work done in Bologna. This was a patient with gastric outlet obstruction, and they were, fell into, into that and ended up doing a pancreatic duodenectomy. Uh, the outcome was uh, very short-lived. Uh, the same year, um, uh, Halstead in Baltimore uh, did the first successful transduodenal ampulectomy, where he opened the duodenum cut out the ampulla from the inside, reconstructed the bile duct and the pancreatic duct on the inside. Uh, and so he's attributed to the first successful resection of one of these periampulary tumors. It was not pancreas cancer. Uh, the first uh, real successful pancreatic duodenectomy was in 1909 uh, in Berlin. Uh, but the procedure carries the name of Whipple, who in 1935 reported uh, three cases of pancreatic duodenectomies that he did for ampullary cancer, not for pancreas cancer. They were very good clinicians back then. They could figure out the difference between ampullary cancer and pancreas cancer. So you all know how to make a good diagnosis, right? What's the proper way to make a good diagnosis? Take a good history. If you cannot make your diagnosis by history, you're in trouble. Okay, all the imaging, all the fancy tests, if you don't, you know, we have this expression that uh, there's no such thing as a bad diagnosis, just an incomplete history. Now, recall in 1935, there was no vitamin K, there was no blood bank, very limited antibiotics, and for sure there were no CT scans on every corner. It's so pretty amazing what uh, these uh, pioneers a procedure with. Here's an illustration of a, a so-called Whipple procedure. So a Whipple procedure is a proximal pancreatic resection. So we're taking out the head. The blood supply to the head and the duodenum is the same, so you have to take them out as a unit and you want to get the regional lymph nodes out. So you split the pancreas in half between the body and, and the head, right through what we call the neck of the pancreas. And right below, behind the neck of the pancreas is your mesenteric vein and portal vein and then you detach the entire duodenum, often with a piece of stomach and the proximal jejunum, 
and detach it from the SMA, which is sitting right behind the SMV. That's your Whipple specimen. The reconstruction involves three connections, reconnecting the, the body and tail of the pancreas, reconnecting the bile duct, and reconnecting the uh, stomach. The outcome for pancreatic duodenectomy has not been great. The morbidity or percent of uh, patients who develop significant complications to this day remains about 50%. Even in high volume centers that specialize. However, we've been able to get the mortality down to less than 5%. Uh, and there are many, many published studies uh, with uh, reported even lower uh, mortalities than uh, 5%. Five year survival for resected pancreas adenocarcinoma on a good day exceeds 20%. It's really low. The median survival, 20 months. The other tumors that we discussed, bile duct, duodenal, and ampullary, have a better outcomes for the same operation. Occasionally, you'll get lucky and you'll get somebody with a small tumor. You'll have negative margins and negative lymph nodes, and those patients have a better five-year survival. Since surgery alone has done so poorly, for many, many decades, we've been trying to give chemotherapy as an adjunct to the surgical resection. So adjuvant therapy is, uh, has been pretty standard. And for many years, we had one drug called 5-FU. Uh, currently, we have basically three regimens that are used uh, commonly. Uh, gemcitabine, uh, which is uh, very well tolerated. Fulfurinox is a four-drug regimen that's a little harder uh, uh, to tolerate, so uh, less applicable and then a combination of uh, gemcitabine and abraxane. Now, the results from adjuvant chemotherapy uh, vary quite widely. Uh, one of the issues is that because of the complexity of the surgery, uh, most people estimate that about a third of patients never get well enough to then get their chemotherapy out. Of those that do survive five years, very few survive much longer. There are very, very few long-term survivors. Uh, this is a recent review uh, out of Stanford trying to look at the population that do survive a long-term to see if they could identify uh, any characteristics of the, those populations to maybe help us figure out who we should be operating on versus who we shouldn't be operating on. And um, as you can see, the lower curve is unresected patients. The upper curve is resected. Uh, mortality at uh, five years is uh, quite high. The uh, curve is pretty, pretty discouraging. You'll see that uh, age at time of diagnosis, the younger you are, the more likely you are, you are to make it to five, 10 years. Uh, the degree of differentiation, obviously, uh, the initial stage, those are all pretty obvious. Uh, adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, was of benefit in this uh, cohort. That's not been shown in all cohorts of interest, even though it is standard therapy. Uh, and then again, the race difference shows up in this uh, cohort. And uh, this not, has not been well understood or studied yet. So what's new for surgeons? Well, uh, the, the concept of giving chemotherapy before surgery is referred to as neoadjuvant therapy. And uh, for patients who have otherwise resectable disease, the use of neoadjuvant is pretty controversial. It's uh, a, a guideline uh, therapy in the US for anybody that's marginally resectable. In other words, the tumor is abutting something that you might not be able to cut out uh, without metastatic disease, and that would be marginally resectable. The European guidelines don't actually even encourage neoadjuvant for um, locally advanced uh, disease unless it's part of a clinical trial because there are no prospective randomized studies to show clear efficacy. Uh, an even smaller population that, um, that has a very advanced, locally advanced disease uh, can be converted to be resectable, uh, but only about in 20% of patients. Why even consider it? Well, one could say, well, let's give everybody chemo up front, 
since they're going to need chemo afterwards. And those that have bad biology aren't going to do very well. And then that probably helps you select out patients that have better biology so that maybe they would therefore benefit more from the uh, investment of an operation. Uh, it assures, obviously, that everybody gets some systemic therapy. And very importantly, uh, the neoadjuvant studies have shown pretty consistently that you can downstage patients a little bit. So you can decrease the incidence of uh, positive margins. And as I mentioned, if you get a positive margin, you really don't get any return on, on, on having had an operation. And you can decrease the incidence of the uh, number of positive lymph nodes. Uh, <clears throat> initially, very, very controversial among surgeons. Everybody was afraid it was going to increase our already high rate of perioperative complications. But uh, the data actually doesn't support that. There's been a lot of talk about regionalization of care and the use of multidisciplinary teams. And uh, this, I think, is important. But it's not very um, applicable depending on what your healthcare system is. OK, there, you know, there's a lot of talk of doing this in the states. But the, the, uh, the states probably has one of the worst healthcare systems because there, there's um, a lot of fractionation and it's just a mess. You know, in places that are lucky to have a uniform health system, they can maybe uh, better af affect the benefits of, of the uh, uh, approach of centralizing uh, uh, diseases that require complex care. Surgical volume uh, has always been looked at as a uh, in the, as a predictor of uh, outcome with decreased mortality. Uh, it turns out that uh, if you look at it critically, it's actually not surgeon's volume, but institutional volume. And as I mentioned earlier, it hasn't changed the morbidity rate. So half the patients still get complications, but it improves what we call the rescue rate. The institution becomes more familiar at picking out the complications and becomes more efficient at actually taking care of the complications. Um, uh, the higher volume centers do appear to have uh, improved overall survival, and there are a lot of potential confounding factors to try and understand exactly why that might be. Again, morbidity remains high for these operations. So you, you operate, you cut out the tumor, I got it all out, and then within 20 months, half your patients have uh, succumbed to their disease. They recur locally, they recur in the liver, they recur in the peritoneal surfaces, and a small percentage outside of the abdomen. The uh, poisons have been tried, just about everyone you can imagine. Uh, and you can see response rates are very, very low. And it wasn't until 1995 that gemcitabine uh, was approved in the U.S., and that became the standard for a long time. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's a uh, drug that's actually pretty well tolerated uh, in terms of its um, toxicity profile. It's, it's a disease. It's a, uh, uh, a an agent that you can give to older patients who are frail and uh, and not hurt them too badly. What uh, the reason I put this slide up was, as I mentioned, response rates for a lot of these uh, drugs that are being tried for this deadly disease didn't, weren't, weren't very high. And the, uh, the company that made Gemsart convinced the FDA to define a different endpoint. And in the studies that were used to get uh, approval for Gemsart, it was based more on clinical benefit and not overall survival. And they defined clinical benefit by uh, the uh, level of pain, the need for pain medications, um, uh, ability to you know, perform uh, daily activities, and so forth. Uh, and so this was the very first drug in the US that was approved primarily on quality of life uh, parameters, which is kind of interesting, because most people think chemo. Oh, ke people are miserable with chemo. But in fact, gems are improved their quality of life. Subsequently, as they learned to redose Gemzar, there was a little bit of benefit. But compared to 5-FU, which was the standard before, before that, 
you're really talking about median survival of four months to five months. I mean, really nothing very dramatic. <clears throat> well, they kept trying more and more drugs. The list is almost endless. These are, as this is just a, 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 a short list of the approved drugs for pancreas cancer. Uh, fast forward to 2007, this is an example of uh, a targeted therapy. So, you know, everybody thought, oh, as we understand the genetics, we can get uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors and maybe be a little more selective in how we approach this pharmacologically. So here's a drug called uh, relotinib, which was approved for pancreas cancer. But you look at those survival curves, and they may be statistically different, but it's not anything to write home about. Okay, so minimal benefit yet gets approval since we're so desperate in, tr in treating this disease. Now, 15 years after Gemzar was approved, finally, this is when Fulfurinox, which is a four drug regimen, 5-FU, Leucovorin, Oxaloplatinum, um, and, and Irinotecan, pretty toxic, but as you can see, at, uh, those survival curves actually look a little bit different. Uh, Gemzar and Abraxane, a um, uh, little better tolerated. Again, we're talking differences in months in median survival. So again, patients present with weight loss, abdominal pain, and jaundice, and most of them can't have surgery. So we need to uh, see if we can palliate some of those symptoms. Biliary obstruction historically was uh, performed by surgeons. We did surgical drainage procedures. That's very rare that we need to do that. Almost all uh, biliary obstruction can be managed endoscopically, if not transhepatically. Uh, classically, it was done with plastic stents, and then these metal stents that uh, came out, they're initially very expensive. Uh, metal stents have become pretty standard now. Uh, because they last longer than the plastic stents. And even though the upfront cost for the metal stent is a little higher, uh, because they last longer, it actually is more cost effective to put metal stents in. Nutrition, some patients present with uh, gastric outlet obstruction. Uh, and that classically and uh, uh, continues to be managed primarily surgically with a what's referred to as a gastro uh, jejunostomy, where you take a piece of downstream intestine and you hook it up to the stomach and you just basically bypass the area of, of obstruction. Uh, very important to remember to give pancreatic enzymes to your patients. These patients walk around with obstructed uh, pancreatic ducts, so they lose the exocrine secretions from the pancreas, so they can't digest and absorb fat, which is our prime, one of our primary caloric sources. And so it's no wonder they lose weight, right? They all have steatorrhea. So you can't forget to add that to, to the regimen. Pain management is important. Analgesics, chemo, as in Gemzar, can help with pain. Uh, radiation therapy for locally advanced disease is also a good adjunct for pain. Um, again, what's often forgotten is what is referred to as the celiac block, where you can uh, inject the uh, celiac plexus around the celiac artery, either fluoroscopically guided, CT guided, or most commonly, at least it depends on where you are as to which expertise you have. Uh, where I work, they're mostly done by endoscopic uh, uh, physicians and they use endoscopic ultrasound to direct it. Now, back when I was a resident, we were doing a prospective randomized study where we were exploring patients and if they were unresectable, we did what was called a double bypass to deal with the biliary obstruction and the, and the potential gastric obstruction. And then we were blindly injecting, and it was literally blinding because we as residents were the ones doing the injections. We could smell which ones were alcohol and which were not because it was either saline or alcohol. And we all thought this was a crazy study. But the results of this study were fascinating. Number one, if you got an alcohol celiac block, at time of death, you had significantly less pain and significantly less use of narcotics. But the reason I put this slide up is that if you looked at the subset who had pain pre-op, they had a survival advantage if they got a celiac block.
which to me means if you can control their pain, they maybe could eat better. If they can eat, they have better nutrition, they live longer. And so it's really important not to forget to optimize your pain management so that you can uh, uh, um, optimize their uh, nutrition as well. Now on the chemo side, why do we fail there? Well, cytotoxic chemotherapy just basically has been insufficient. And um, targeted chemotherapy is great, but we have limited targets. As I mentioned, there's a huge heterogeneity of the uh, molecular abnormalities, and so there are only a certain number of targets. So probably the most exciting uh, one that is now in clinical use are the PARP inhibitors for the, uh, uh, the BRCA patients, the ones that carry the, uh, the breast cancer gene, which increases their risk for pancreas cancer. And, um, but this represents a very, very small percentage of, of the uh, pancreas uh, patients. So if attacking it with uh, cytotoxic agents doesn't work, when you think about it, having cancer is not just cells that are growing ab in an abnormal fashion, it's also an immune system that has failed. I mean, our uh, natural killer cells are supposed to identify non-self uh, and recognize these abnormal cells and destroy them. Uh, and so immunotherapy um, should be something that uh, would help us. And uh, up to now, all the immunotherapy you hear that's very exciting for melanoma, renal cell, even lung cancer, has done almost nothing in pancreas cancer. Uh, the, the one exception there, again, are those patients with Lynch syndrome, hereditary non -polyposis. And the, And if you think about it, those patients have mismatched repair genes, so they accumulate a lot of mutations so that when they get cancer, they have a lot of extra antigens on their tumor cells, and so they have more immunologic targets. So if you look at colon cancer, uh, sporadic colon cancer doesn't really respond to immunotherapy, but the Lynch patients, you give them a PD-1 inhibitor and their tumors disappear. It's pretty, pretty impressive, the response rates. So people are starting to look at combinations of uh, immunotherapies Again, trying to find something that works. And again, I put the stroma up here because the real problem is that we need to better understand this desmoplastic response that exists around the pancreas tumor where things are very hypovascular and very hypoxic. And this microenvironment is uh, allowing the tumors to evade the chemo and allowing the tumors to evade immune surveillance. So I think that for systemic therapies, we're going to have to address that issue. Now, just uh, to tease you, there was a paper written just a few months ago. Um, uh, uh, and this was the headline in, in one of the UK publications. And uh, this breakthrough uh, relates to a protein, uh, GREM1, which uh, apparently is important in maintaining the heterogeneity of, of cells in this pancreatic uh, stroma, and you can manipulate that in mice and actually have tumors disappear. And so here's an example of manipulating the stroma that has this apparent significant impact in mice. Unfortunately, throughout my whole career, we've seen so many things that work in mice, and fortunately, uh, we're not that closely related to rats. <laughs> So the multidisciplinary approach for pancreas cancer is local therapies, uh, surgery primarily, radiotherapy I haven't talked about too much since it hasn't helped as much as we had hoped for. But it really is a systemic disease, so we're, we're dependent on uh, some type of chemotherapy, uh, limited uh, utility and targeted therapies, and maybe immune therapy if we learn how to uh, allow, uh, uh, break through the uh, microenvironment that that might help. <clears throat> I've had an interest in hyperthermia. Okay, so we talked about radiation, chemo, and surgery. The fourth modality of cancer therapy is actually elevation in temperature. Okay, we've known for centuries that occasionally patients who have febrile illnesses will show regression of tumors described by the Egyptians, described by Hippocrates, uh, and 
internationally, if you look at um, cancer centers internationally, you'll see that many of them uh, have some version of hyperthermia as part of the uh, management of patients with advanced cancers. <clears throat> uh, in the US, uh, systemic hyperthermia uh, was practiced uh, back in the late 1800s. You could go to a famous cancer institute in New York called Memorial Sloan Kettering. There was a guy named Cooley there who used to inject gram-negative rod mixtures into people to induce fevers and got response rates in cancers that were better than a lot of those chemo agents that we give. Response rates in ovarian cancer were almost 30%. And so they practiced these Cooley's toxins until about the 1950s. And then the FDA outlawed hyperthermia because we didn't know what it was, what, how it worked or whether it worked. But the reality was, if you think about it, in the 1950s is when modern cytotoxic chemo came on the market. And there was probably a little more money in, in handing out poisons than injecting gram-negative rods. And so that's the way the world runs, right? Um, Hyperthermia is defined as uh, temperatures between 40 and uh, 44. Uh, it's, cyto it's directly cytotoxic in cells even at low PO2. So uh, pancreas adenocarcinoma is one of the most hypoxic tumors around. And so, uh, so uh, the, uh, people have been trying to understand uh, how to take advantage of that in, in some of the therapeutic uh, uh, interventions. Uh, and obviously, um, we talked about how there's hypoperfusion in tumors and then hyperthermia obviously would improve blood flow as well. Um, we, uh, uh, so my interest in hyperthermia uh, started with regional hyperthermia in a process referred to as hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, or HYPEC. And that's become uh, much more popular with uh, limited data. Uh, but the concept of heat is that you can take a petri dish of cells, heat them up to 42 degrees, and you get a certain kill through a heat shock protein mechanism that resets apoptotic pathways. You can take the same petri dish and pour a bunch of chemo in there, and you'll get a certain kill. And then if you put the two together, you actually get synergy. So based on that is how the HIPEC uh, stuff started. Uh, the history I already told you about the previous century. And then in the 1980s, systemic hyperthermia got sort of reintroduced in the US. Does anyone know what the epidemic we had in the uh, mid to late 1980s? AIDS. So that's when we had AIDS. AIDS was a, a disease of immunosuppression. People thought heat had been used as an immune stimulator maybe. So systemic hyperthermia was reintroduced in the U.S. to treat AIDS and actually it had uh, efficacy. Uh, one of the groups that was uh, working with the uh, AIDS um, uh, studies uh, continued the work and said, hey, this used to work for cancer. Let's start looking at it at cancer. For AIDS, obviously, the pills came out, and that was a better business model, so the pills took over. And uh, they went on and published a study in lung cancer. So advanced lung cancer, they were able to almost quadruple expected survival with one treatment of systemic hyperthermia induced by setting up a venovenous circuit hooking it up to a heater, and elevating your central uh, core temperature to 42 degrees. Uh, we, uh, um, so it's interesting, that work was done at uh, University of Texas in Galveston, and their program was literally washed away one day by a hurricane. <laughs> and, uh, but when we learned about their work, our group in San Jose, we actually did a phase one study to reactivate their technology and we studied uh, third-time recurrent ovarian cancer patients and uh, did tw uh, basically a phase one study and uh, uh, achieved a median survival of 20 months where uh, the uh, historical controls would have been nine months. Uh, <clears throat> working with the FDA is a very slow process. 
but we've, uh, the same group has now restarted uh, this same protocol uh, for hospice eligible patients. And, um, and we just, it was just started up again last year in Texas. And of the 13 patients that uh, have been treated, we have not reached uh, a median survival yet. So again, hyperthermia is directly cytotoxic, but I think it's primarily an immune therapy. And the patients that you see responses to, it's not immediate, it's actually quite delayed. And so you can uh, uh, imagine that obviously fever, it would make sense, should induce your immune system so that you uh, can uh, fight infectious disease. So this is the, uh, the uh, new area of um, therapies that uh, perhaps has some promise in the future uh, in, in, as a systemic therapy for our uh, pancreas patients. Now, what about the future in pancreas cancer? This is my favorite slide. I made this slide 30 years ago when I first gave this lecture. If we go one by one, you'll see not a whole lot has changed. So we've talked about early diagnosis. Early diagnosis is critical because if we can't diagnose early, cutting tumors out isn't gonna help. Now, the problem with early diagnosis is there's so much heterogeneity in the molecular genetics of these tumors that there isn't gonna be a simple test and it's gonna be very hard to achieve any specificity or sensitivity. Um, as some of you may be familiar with uh, the concept of uh, liquid biopsies. We've known for decades that tumors, uh, tumor cells circulate in your systemic circulation very early in the development of cancers. And so you can take blood samples and define the molecular genetics of the primary tumor. Uh, but without uh, a more homogeneous uh, um, characterization of these tumors, I don't think we're gonna get very far with early diagnosis. Identification of high uh, risk groups, well, we're getting better at that. Problem is we don't have good screening tests. So even patients who have known increased risk we're not very good at picking it up. Just like in the ovarian cancer patients, we know that the BRCA patients all can, are gonna get ovarian cancer, but we don't have a good test for uh, screening ovarian cancer, which is why a lot of those patients end up getting prophylactic uh, oophorectomies. Improved selection of surgical patients. Again, we talked a little bit about uh, how maybe um, neoadjuvant will help you select out the bad players in terms of the bad biology. Uh, it turns out that even though the molecular genetics is very heterogeneous, the, there may be some identifiable, uh, identifiable subtypes of adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. And 10 years from now, we may not even be talking about the, the disease as one disease. Uh, new drug combinations and regimens, obviously, um, that will continue in the hopes of finding something that will help systemically, especially in immunotherapy. Uh, radio sensitizers probably uh, don't really play a role because ra uh, local radiation hasn't not ended, has ended up not helping very much, which makes sense because like surgery, it's a local treatment for what we now clearly know is a systemic disease. And even 30 years ago, we were talking about gene therapy, okay? Uh, so again, this is the sort of summary slide to remind you of the progression of the disease and the problem that we have early on, uh, that we don't have a way to identify, you know, if everybody got said, you know, KRAS is your, your, what you need to measure, then great, you can do KRAS, uh, but it's too nonspecific, um, and so we don't, we are not likely to get any good uh, screening tests there. So uh, I thought I could um, end with this quote. Hippocrates recognized that uh, diseases that medicines could not cure are cured by the knife. And those that are uh, not cured by the knife, cannot be cured by the knife, can be cured by fire. So maybe hyperthermia is, is the, uh, the way to go. And uh, those that uh, can't be cured, they're wholly incurable. Thank you very much.